Hello, it's Scott Manley here on my kind of crappy cam right now, but a lot of people are saying, hey, what did you think of Elon Musk's latest pre uh, presentation at IAC in Adelaide? Now, he did one last year, making humans a multi-planetary species. And uh, that was basically where they introduced the original BFR, which is code name for a big fracking rocket. This year, it's all changed. There's a whole bunch of new stuff, then there's uh, some old stuff has gone away. So in the last year, they've decided, by the way, that Red Dragon isn't going to happen. If you remember, Red Dragon was where they were going to take a Dragon 2 capsule and use a hypersonic, you know, aerodynamics on a capsule to slow it down and then use the Super Draco rockets to land it safely on the surface of Mars. Now, it was confirmed a couple of months ago that that wasn't happening anymore because SpaceX were doing something better. And they were, weren't totally clear about that, but it was also understood that uh, this, part of this was because NASA, looking for Crew Dragon for their uh, commercial uh, crew program, weren't really happy with the notion of having uh, landing legs that went through the heat shield. So if they could avoid doing that, it made their uh, certification process a whole lot easier. So anyway, yeah, what did the presentation go on about? Well, first of all, he talked about uh, how um, they were looking for ways to pay for things and they decided that they were basically going to stop making Falcon at some point in the future and replace it with something new called... BFR. But it's not quite as big as the previous BFR. It's a smaller version of BFR. Now, it's still going to use their uh, carbon fiber oxygen tank, and they showed uh, some pictures of it, of their giant tank, which they took out into the middle of the ocean, pressurized up to its limit, and then pushed it beyond its limit, whereupon it became the first part of the BFR to actually go airborne. Uh, they demonstrated the Raptor engine. They've got something like 20 minutes of uh, burn time uh, across 42 different tests. Um, so their, their chamber pressure is now up to something like 200 atmospheres, and they reckon that with enough work they could get it up to 300, which is just kind of mind-boggling, you know, to imagine that inside a, like a cylinder, a pressurized gas cylinder is you know, okay, but imagine a, an engine with a combustion process happening inside that. They want to get propulsive landing perfected. So perfected that they won't need landing legs. They will literally fly it down onto some sort of gantry that will catch it without the, the extra mass of the landing legs being necessary. Where I'm going, we don't need legs, right? Uh, they brought, put up a graph. Looks like he's predicting 30 Falcon 9 launches next year. Also confirmed that Falcon Heavy is still on schedule for later this year. But Falcon Heavy was way more complicated than they imagined. It basically involved re-engineering large parts of the spacecraft. So, uh, you know, it seems that that particular approach may not be working for them, which is one of the reasons why... They're looking at basically making BFR the rocket that they're going to use. Now, BFR is going to be 9 meters wide, like 104, 105 meters tall. It's going to be 4,200 tons at launch. Two-stage rocket with the second stage being a, a single unit. Essentially, the... Uh, payload is going to be in a reusable section. It's going to have the engines and the fuel tanks in there all in one. And they added a little delta wing on the back, a very small one with a split flap so they have aerodynamics control. Now it'll still use that for control during re-entry but once it slows down enough it'll flip around and do retro propulsion and land vertically. Uh, the fuel tanks will have something like 800, sorry, 860 tons of liquid oxygen, 240 tons of uh, methane. And inside, if you like those giant fuel tanks, then they went full-on exhibit with this, right? Inside the methane tank, there's another pair of fuel and oxygen tanks. And the reason for this is that when you're doing something like a landing, you're turning a lot, and all those turns tend to cause the fuel in the tanks to slosh around, especially if the tanks have been depleted. So by having these header tanks that are much smaller, it means they can reduce many of these problems, reduce the amount of uh, the sloshing a whole lot. Now, the 
engine end of the thing is going to have six engines. There will be four vacuum engines and two smaller uh, surface level, sea level engines. The larger vacuum engines won't have the same level of gimbal capability, but the sea level ones will have full capability and they should, in theory, be able to land on a single engine. So it will designed to be landed on two, but if one goes out, then they still have enough thrust. The engines will go from 20% to 100% thrust, and the specific impulse they're reporting now is uh, about 330 seconds, with the vacuum engines going up to something like 375 seconds. The refueling process has changed from the original BFR uh, concept video. Instead of docking the spacecraft side by side or piggyback, they're going to dock them back to back, like, you know, some sort of weird sex move. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then they're going to, to make sure the fuel flows, which was one question that came up um, in the previous design, to make sure the fuel flows, they're actually just going to use active, you know, milli. Um, milli G thrusters to make sure the fuel has settled correctly. So uh, he then popped up a big chart showing a bunch of rockets and their cost. They obviously included their Falcon 1 at one end, the Saturn 5 at the other, and the BFR right up at the top. Did not include the SLS, but of course Elon was always saying that he could have built the SLS a whole lot cheaper and a lot of the costs for the SLS were down to politics rather than actual requirements. So... He then flips the graph around and says, but look, the BFR is going to be cheaper to launch than the Falcon 1 was. And the Falcon 1, if you remember, was the first rocket that SpaceX built. It used a single Merlin engine, and the Merlin engine back then was a whole lot less complicated. It used a, a graphite, um, it used a graphite ablative nozzle, for example, rather than a regenerative cooling system. So... Yeah, a lot has changed, but they think they're going to be able to reuse the BFR so many times that, uh, yeah, it'll be cheaper to launch. Of course, you know, it's still a long way out. Granted, they have demonstrated at least one reuse of a Falcon 9, but, again, that's a long way to making it so reusable that they can refly it at short notice. Now, uh, uh, with the refueling in space, uh, that opens up a lot of destinations to the BFR design. And he popped up a big slide that said, look, we can launch satellites. We can go to the International Space Station. We can go to moon, the moon. And to get to the moon, they are going to need to refuel in, low or in Earth orbit. But instead of being a circular Earth orbit, they're going to go on a, an eccentric Earth orbit so that they're already part way to the moon. Once they refuel in there, they can boost all the way to the moon, land on the moon, and then return without refueling at any point. And this is kind of cool. This is um, back in the Apollo era when they were designing the Saturn V. They were asking, you know, do we want to go to the moon using a Earth rendezvous? Do you want to have a big rocket, right? Or do you want to do lo lunar orbit rendezvous? And obviously lunar orbit rendezvous is what was chosen, but Earth orbit rendezvous is kind of what's being described here, albeit with a vastly more high-tech spacecraft. Um, they claim that, or he was saying that with the 9-meter sized spacecraft, they could launch a new Hubble with like 10 times the mirror area in a single launch, which is fantastic. But, uh, you know, with 150 ton payload capacity, the, there's not going to be, it's not going to suit every single mission. So you've got to figure out with the rocket being suitable for launching more than just a single payload, single very large payload. Uh, I think obviously part of the plan is they will have their old falcons and dragons sitting around. They'll have plenty that they can reuse and they will be still cheaper than everything else. Uh, <laughs> they, he put up a nice picture of uh, a rendering of what the BFR would look like if it was docked to the space station. And yes, that would be very impressive, but I'm not sure what they would need to, what they could do with 150 tons of cargo delivered to the space station. Remember, the space station in orbit is, you know, 200 tons. You could practically launch a big part of the a new space station with one. But yeah, they could go to the moon. That was the next thing they showed. Uh, they had a nice little render with the crane coming out the side. Looked very tin tin, if you ask me. 
but obviously this kind of pivot towards including the moon is partly a response to changing priorities at NASA because of course every time a new every time the White House changes hands they, they change the current plans for NASA to between the moon and Mars and you know oh the moon isn't ambitious enough let's go to Mars oh the Mars is too ambitious we want to go back to the moon and so on and so forth and eventually we will get somewhere and something will happen the Mars uh, Mars architecture, well, they are still going to do ISRU, right, in situ resource utilization on the surface of Mars. So that means they send a spacecraft ahead, they build up a bunch of solar panels, and they start converting water that they extract from the soil and carbon dioxide they extract from the atmosphere into methane and liquid oxygen. Once you've got enough fuel there, of course, it means you can fly back. The descent profile to Mars, uh, he threw up a really cool movie showing that. Now, uh, it's going to entirely fly down aerodynamic from a hyperbolic trajectory. So it's going to come in, there's not going to be any capture orbit, it's going to go straight down and uh, use that delta wing to control the descent, slow it down, and then towards the end, it'll do a skip re uh, to bring it up and then slow down, reverse, and per land on those rear engines. And that should be totally possible within those limits. I'm actually wondering about the lunar landing, to be honest, because with uh, two engines that work at 50% thrust on the Earth, that means a single engine, or two engines would have to run at like less than 10% thrust. They can't throttle low enough to land as reliably on the moon, but I'm presuming the software is getting better and better. And hey, at least they don't have to land on a pitching and rolling barge like they do. So then we get to SpaceX, uh, you know, milestones and timelines. Yes, suggested that in 2022, they would be able to launch their first cargo mission to Mars. Now, these would be cargo ships they would be set up to start building the ISRU system. And, okay, 2022 is ridiculously ambitious. I don't think that will happen. And you have to realize that with Mars things, if you delay by even a month or two, you pretty much have to wait a whole two years before you get to the next transfer window to the planet. So I don't see 2022 happening, but, you know, I guess... That's the way they work. They shoot for these ambitious goals and, you know, let them slip. They move their goalposts. And as long as they're always moving forward, it feels like they're doing the right thing. Uh, now then, the plan for a crewed mission would be the next launch window when they would launch four spacecraft. So it would be two spacecraft on the first one, four on the second, with two of them carrying crew. And this would set up... Uh, an even bigger Mars base designed for, you know, uh, for prospecting and collecting the material and the fuel and refining all that. I, uh, <laughs> again, you know, I'm not sure it'll happen that fast. I think that SpaceX sometimes has a bit of a disconnect between what level of technology is possible and what level of technology and safety expectations are acceptable to the people that decide these things. There's a cool little video in there of Mars Sim City where they build out Mars. And then, yeah, then he goes way off and says, hey, why don't we just use the BFR as a very fast shuttle between points on the Earth? Uh, showing flying from New York to Shanghai in 40 minutes. That, of course, doesn't include the incredibly detailed security checks that would be required, the long time it would take to drive out, you know, to sh move everybody out to board the spacecraft. The launch would be 40 minutes and then you would have disembarking. It would be a lot more than that. And I'm going to say right now, there is no way legally you can fly rockets from one country to another right now because rockets fly very, very quickly. And, you know, New York has some experience of what happens when rapid moving pieces of transportation hardware crash into things. So I, th I don't see this happening anytime soon, but we can always dream, right? So, yeah, that's the rough outline of the talk. I mean... 
yeah, a uh, lo little more details, obviously continuing to push things out. This is very speculative, but it is interesting to hear that it, it seems that SpaceX's plan is to go all in on the BFR as the replacement for the Falcon. It's not going to be as big as the previous one. And I'm presuming at some point it will get a better code name, but all the same, I kind of like BFR, you know, for many, many reasons. So yeah, uh, go and check out the talk, it's on the SpaceX channel. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.